First National Financial has been called one of Canada's greatest business success stories. It's now the largest non-bank lender in the country with over $100 billion in mortgages under administration, close to 1,000 employees and offices that span from coast to coast. And it all began here in a small office above a Toronto pub back in 1988. I think you, you have to remember that when Stephen and I started it, um, we had five employees in one office um, and we were just worried about if we could make the payroll for the next month. From that modest beginning, co-founder Stephen Smith and Marie Taz went on to build a financial powerhouse. I would say it's as, probably as much a surprise as it is. Probably the only pe two people are more surprised than Maury and I are our wives. I think what Stephen and Maury had right was, was the service side of the business, uh, absolutely. Um, we always knew that we had to service customers, otherwise there was no reason for them to come back to us. That ongoing commitment to customer service has propelled First National's impressive growth for the past 30 years. It's now a market leader in both residential and commercial mortgages. It helps finance over 300,000 Canadian households, and it serves over 5,000 commercial real estate borrowers. The work that Stephen and Maury did created a template for us to, to build a large group and a very organized group. And what are the secrets behind First National's astounding success? I think uh, over the last 30 years, I think it's always been essential to Maury and I that we have a type of place that we're proud of. It's not something that we had a grand plan or scheme to get to 100 billion. I think it's just 30 years of really good customer service, having amazing employees that have taken different areas right across the country, expanded those areas, and expanded the name of First National. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Sensed, and Maury, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And I gotta say, that was a very impressive video. Thanks, Peter. So Maury, what you and Stephen Smith created is really one of Canada's great business success stories. And I just wanna review the highlights. Um, that was a market cap of approximately $2 billion. That's more than 1,000 employees. And now First National is the largest non-bank lender in Canada today. That's really, really remarkable. So we now have the privileged opportunity of hearing the story of Maury. So Maury, I'd like to go right back to the early days. We get this great picture of where you are today and where First National is incredibly successful. But let's start with the early days. What was it like growing up as Maury Toss? Well, as I'm sure you know, I grew up in Rosedale and um, I come from a family of generational wealth. Um, I graduated top of my class at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no, wait a minute. That's John Love and Blake Hutchison. Sorry, oh, wrong, right. wrong guy. Sorry. All right. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. I grew up in a three-story walk up I, in I, Etobicoke, right. where I spent most of my life uh, with uh, blue-collar parents, uh, always uh, wondering what we were going to eat a couple days before payday came in every couple of weeks. And I learned very, very, very early that I had to depend on myself if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to go and have things and do things. I started my early working career when I was eight years old heading down to the Humber Valley Golf Course, hunting for golf balls uh, during the week and then selling them on the weekend. You know, and even back then, we were, you know, we were talking, uh, you know, 1965, you know, I could pull in 20 bucks a weekend, you know, which was really large money no at tax. that time. Yeah. Uh, as I got older, I knew I couldn't do that, so I moved on to a more respectable job. I started guessing people's weight at the CNE every summer. <laughs> Incredible, fun, fun job, meeting a lot of people, trying to get them to laugh, trying to get them to come in. You know, it was actually one of my favorite jobs that I ever had. Uh, and uh, as I moved on through high school, what became really important to me was getting to know people, uh, having lots of friends, having lots of groups of friends, not just a few friends, but having groups here, groups there, group at that school, group at another school. It was really important to me. I really enjoyed meeting a lot of people. You know, because probably I got bored with them fairly quickly, so I had to move on to, to another group. But I think I took that in my business career all the way along, that, you know, people was uh, meeting people, enjoying people, having them enjoy me would be what I would be successful at all my life. 
I love it. That was incredibly candid. Um, I didn't know that early chapter about the Harvard. I was kind of going, I don't remember that in the notes. So thank you for the clarification. So you, you started out, you know, and, and I think it was Rexdale, and you were working at an early age, and you, and you decided to, you worked your way up, and you went into banking. So, you know, how did you get the idea? You go into banking, you've got the kind of background you've got. Where does the idea suddenly go, I want to start my own business? Uh, you know, it's funny. Banking is, when I was a kid, I would see the people working in the bank, and I always thought, boy, that's a job. You know, that's respectable. Everybody respects a banker. So it was, it was the one area that I always wanted to go into. Uh, I went through a precipitous route. I actually started a finance company, knocking on doors and re repossessing uh, vacuum cleaners. And, uh, but I learned credit, and I learned deep credit on how to read it, how to understand it, and how to read people when you're granting credit. I moved on there to the CIBC, which was a great experience. Uh, and then I got recruited to guarantee trust, not for my great knowledge, but it was for my good hockey hands. They were short <laughs> one hockey player on the, in the trust companies league. So uh, I went on to guarantee trust just to run a branch. Uh, and then I got promoted to run the mortgage banking branch uh, down on Bay Street for guarantee trust. And we started to put um, guarantee trust could never fulfill uh, deposits the way we could fill mortgages through mortgage brokers. So I started to um, you know, get on the phone call and say, hey, I got these packages of mortgages, NHA mortgages, uh, and I started just to phone people. And one of the first people I found a card of was my partner, Stephen Smith. He was at a small investment um, uh, bond dealer called First Canadian Securities. And he said, geez, you know, I'm, I'm not doing any business right now. I'd like to get on the phone and try to sell those. So for a couple of years, I would put packages of mortgages together and uh, he would sell them to people like Confed Life, Allstate Insurance, Mutual Life. Um, there was a lot of trust companies back then. There was a lot of small banks. There was a lot of insurance companies. And most of them didn't have asset gathering ab abilities because they were fairly small. So I, uh, you know, we started to do a really good business and make a lot of money. I'd be getting these checks for 100,000, 200,000 premiums uh, for guaranteed trust. And one day, Steve and I were out in Vancouver with Seabor Life, another insurance company gone. And we said, hey, do you need guaranteed trust to do this? And I says, no, you know, I got the relationships, I think, with brokers. They'd send us business. And he said, well, I sure don't need my dealer. So we decided that we would go and, um, and just start our own company, originate mortgages, and see if we could sell them in packages to all these people. It was just when mortgage-backed securities were just starting. Ivan Wall had just started, um, uh, I think, with GMC, I think it was called, which was uh, the first securitizer. And uh, we went and pitched Mutual Life, and they said, we'll be your joint venture partner uh, in this. So I quit this great job with a golf membership and an expense account and a pretty good money. I told my wife, I'm quitting to start my own business. Uh, and, you know, she was very, very supportive. I knew I could always go back and get a job back in the industry. And we were in business for about three weeks, and that mortgage-backed security business collapsed. And Mutual said, you know, we're not interested anymore. So that was the first crisis in our business. Uh, you know, we got on the phone, we started to call every institution in the country, uh, and we brought in Prudential of America, and they said, you know what, we need lots of mortgage assets. So we started selling directly to them, Seaboard Life we sold to, Industrial Alliance, National Life, and we started to build a pretty good business in uh, selling, uh, selling packaged mortgages, at that time just single family to institutions, and just sort of grew from there. What a fabulous story. I love that. So, so a lot of times when people create a business, they've got a mentor or a role model. Did somebody play that kind of role for you? You know, our business, it was so new. I mean, Steve and I said, you know, there's lots of brokers out there with business, but there's no one there being the intermediary to help the companies that don't have underwriting, don't have mortgage administration, don't have the knowledge of how to gain these assets. Uh, and so we sort of thought we should be like a mutual fund company you know, don't take any risk, slice off a little bit of fee going through and pass the risk on and whether real estate goes up or down, you know, we're going to continue to grow our business. And that was kind of the model that we had. Okay, so. Mentors, yeah. no, there was no one in that business, right? You know, yeah. I was Steven's mentor and he was my mentor. We talked all the time what we could do. I mean, Steven said, you know, it's taking us so long with the type of pools typing out these mortgage commitments. I'm going to write a computer software program. And I said, what's that? And uh, so this is, you know, we're talking 1988, and Stephen came up with our Merlin system, which was, you know, complete computer underwriting where if there's a change in interest rates, you know, you just 
and print out the new commitment instead of sending it to a typing pool. So even though we were small, we were really leading edge. On, and we just, uh, you know, Stephen had some, uh, I had the mortgage background. Stephen had um, sort of the institutional sales and, uh, and, and um, we just sort of molded together and we figured out how we could make a one plus one equal three and we could take the third. And it turned out to be, you know, very mm -hmm. successful. We still, we still do that today. We always looking how we can find something in the marketplace that's not being utilized and how we can be better at it than anyone else. Well, that's a great partnership when you rely on each other, when you're each a mentor and a role model to the other. I love it. That's great success. So speaking of success, when you look back on the career already and you've got lots more chapters to write, what makes you the most proud at this stage for your accomplishments? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's almost cliche to say, oh, it's the people. It's the people in our organization. But what's really, really nice is the people in our organization, a lot of them have been there right from the beginning. A lot of them work for me at Guarantee Trust. They're still there. You know, we had our first, our first receptionist just retired. She was just under 70 years old. You know, we've had our commercial, uh, you know, our commercial guys, Peter Cook, Drew McCauley. Um, they've been with us for over 30 years, pretty much since we, since we started. And, you know, and they're, they're loyal and they're appreciative. And when you get people like that, you want to give back to those people. They all feel that they built the company. And that's what you want when you own a company. You want everyone to feel that they are contributing and they're getting recognized and rewarded for it. And to me, you know, you know even people running the accounting department have been there for so long. Uh, and we've always had fun. Okay, we've never, we've always been sort of thin layer. Anyone that wanted to come up and talk to me or Stephen, no matter what you're doing, was always welcome, come on in. We always want to hear what you have to say. And it's, uh, it, it's always been a great, great environment to work at. And that, I think, you know, that's what, you know, I think makes me the proudest that, you know, we have such a great team. I love it. So that's the success side. Um, what about looking back on the toughest challenges? What, what was your toughest challenge and how did you deal with it? You know, we always have tough challenges, and as you get bigger, they get bigger, but, you know, they don't even bother me anymore. Like, you know, when we have a crisis, it doesn't bother us anymore because we've seen them all. The biggest, you know, the first crisis we had, I guess, was 1998. We decided we were going to put all these mortgage-backed securities together, and we're going to sell them for a big profit. Well, just when we got all the pools together and we had them financed and leveraged to the hilt, we had the Russian ruble crisis. Now, for... Some of you that in 1998, some of you that you don't even know what that was, but that was a that was the first huge worldwide financial crisis, and the value of assets just went down, and there was no MBS market, there was no institutions buying anything, everyone was frozen, and uh, you know, for Steve and I, you know, we were, you know, we were going, this is serious, but we did what we always did, we got on the phone, we started to call people that we knew. People that were maybe outside of these, the pension funds, you know, some of the life companies, uh, you know, some of the smaller investment dealers, have you got anybody? And we sort of sold off that piece and actually made a little bit of money. But, you know, when we did that, we felt really good. We felt, you know what, we had a crisis and, you know, we got on the phone and we solved the crisis. You know, and there's been crisis, you know, when we first started, we'd have, we had three life insurance companies were funding all our product. And then Prudential of America got sold. And they said, you know, they were buying, you know, 40% of our product. And they said, oh, we don't need any product anymore. We've been sold. And it was, oh, well, this is serious. And then six months later, Mutual Life called up and said, you know what? We've bought Mutual Trust. We don't need product anymore. So suddenly, we didn't have any clients buying our product. Got on the phone, started to call, you know, started to bring in pension funds, more life companies, uh, small trust companies, you know, and we built a bigger business because of those crises. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the time that we sort of filled, we had more people wanting product than we could generate. But, you know, again, you know, when you're in crisis, you know, you, you've just got to dig down and, and work and try to work yourself mm -hmm. out of it. Of course, and then in 2008, um, when that crisis hit, uh, we were big players by that time and we were selling... Um, uh, commercial paper. And for some of you who don't know what the commercial paper is, we would pledge NHA insured mortgage assets uh, and then we would sell 30 day commercial paper against it. And your banks would be your, your conduits. Um, so they would be your sales agents. And they gave you what they call a liquidity provision that if they couldn't sell them, they would buy them. 
But when 2008 um, hit, suddenly, you know, we had, I think we had $500 million worth of mortgages out there. And, you know, one of the banks, I don't want to really mention the name, CIBC, called up <laughs> and said, we want our 500, we can't sell your paper, we want our $500 million back in 15 days. Uh, or else we're putting you in default. Uh, and so, you know what? As you can all remember, 2008, it was, it was pretty bad. All the banks, you know, I remember TD Bank was issuing new shares at 34 bucks. CIBC was issuing 10-year uh, bonds at 10%. Uh, it was bad in the marketplace. People were wondering if Rio Can would survive. Could they ever get financing again? Would the bank survive when with no deposits coming in? It was, it was a really bad crisis back then. Got on the phones, okay, who doesn't raise deposits? Started to call the pension funds, started to call the life insurance companies, and within 15 days, we'd sold off that full $500 million block. So that was a real crisis, and you know what? Anything after that, we just go, we'll solve it. You know, when we sit with a risk committee, and one thing about, we have risk committees, and we found out over the years, well, what could go wrong? You can never think of what's going to go wrong. You can think of all the things that everybody can think of what's going to go wrong, but you never pick what actually goes wrong. No one saw 2008 coming. No one saw 98 Russian ruble crisis coming. Uh, you know, you've got to deal with the crisis when it happens. You can't really plan for it. And people will say, well, we were planning for this crisis. You just can't do it because it's going to come for an area that you just can't, you just can't imagine. I think that was such great advice because it just seems like the world is it's less predictable today. So with a, with a big global business that we run, I can tell you we're feeling it, we're seeing it, there's always something. Just not to overreact, that's perfect. Okay, so, so within your space, um, First National is really the gold standard. You've had such predictable growth, such great growth. How do you create it? How do you keep it going? Um, you know, it's two things. Of course, it's, you know, our people are compensated by the business that they do. And so, you know, that's a great model in any type of business, I think, because they're out there on their phone, they're out there all the time knocking on doors. Uh, Jeremy Wedgbury in our office has put in an amazing plan on the commercial side. Uh, we have team coaches inside. We have uh, just amazing follow-up systems. Everyone who works for us has to work hard. And in the end, they're really rewarded by it. So um, I think the key is just trying to stay ahead of the competition. We know who our competition is. We're always looking down on them, and we're trying to figure out how we can get farther ahead. They're always looking up, saying, you know, we're number two or number three, we want to work harder. We're looking at them saying, we've got to put more distance between us and our competitors. And, uh, you know, we are experts. You know, we changed the whole model of providing financing in our business to providing advice. We have so many of the clients in this room, I know that when they want information on rental rates, costs, constructions, can you look at this budget? We have the team and the expertise that can really help them understand what they're doing. Because let's face it, you know, most of us are in this business, if you're apartment building owners or, or a developer, you're doing one building or two building, you're, you're kind of in your own little bubble, right? There's not a lot of great places to go in information. So we've really changed our shop into doing advisory work, and it's advisory work for free, sort of. Um, but I think that's really what's kept us ahead is like mm -hmm. good people, good training, and keep us in a focus of where we want to be next year at this time. And you know, we set goals and then we stretch, stretch goals, and it's just amazing that each year we seem to hit our stretch goal. And I'm, I'm just amazed, Jeremy comes up with some of our targets, he says, I think I can drive this team to do this next year. And I'm, okay, that's great, let's do it, you know, but uh, it's amazing that, you know, if you would put a program in place, um, I mean, there's probably no one out here in that business that we haven't, someone hasn't reached out to you. And I think the key is when people have done a deal with us, they typically don't go anywhere else the second time, you know, so that's, you know, I think that's a credit to the whole team uh, and the whole business philosophy. That's the mindset that it takes to be a winner, not getting complacent, wanting to stretch the lead. Good for you. I like that. So when I think about the history of what you and Stephen did, um, one of the most exciting periods must have been the time when you were going public. Can you, can you share for us, what was it like? What were the events like when you were actually taking the company from a private side to the public markets? Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, we were fairly big. It was Stephen and myself. You know, we own 100% of the company. Um, and we were starting to do, you know, some big loans. And, you know, we were issuing commitments for $50 million or $75 million per loan. 
And I remember Tom Schwartz came up to me and he says, Maury, you know, I like you. You guys have helped us. How do I know you're going to fund this loan when, when I need the money? Uh, and Steve and I thought about that. And we'd heard so many comments. Well, it's just Stephen and Maury's mortgage company, you know, which doesn't give you a lot of comfort or uh, that, uh, you know, does he really have $75 million to lend me? Uh, and we started to think of our profile with our institutions and the rating agencies. And what we needed was we needed to get our services rated. Um, so we actually had investment grade ratings on our servicing on our ability to fund. Uh, and so that's when we said, Stephen, let's take a portion of the company public. Um, and so that we can just open all these doors and suddenly people say, hey, it's a public company. They're real, they're big, I can see everything. Uh, and it was the best move we ever did. I mean, as soon as we went public, it, we just exploded. People were never interested in talking to us. We're talking to us. People would never let us administer mortgages. We're letting us administer mortgages for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and as the share price went up, as we like to say at our annual meeting, you know, if you invested $10, you know, in our initial IPO, we've already paid you back almost $19 of uh, dividends, you know, and the share price is up, you know, and I think somewhere closed up at $37 from $10 uh, a couple of days ago. So it really, really helped us grow our profile, you know, with borrowers, with lenders, with rating agencies, with CMHC, with, uh, with OSFI. I mean, we're not OSFI regulated, uh, but all our clients are. So when OSFI came in and they, they, they were, you know, they're worried, you're administering billions and billions of dollars for, of people's of, of people's money, institutional money, and when they left, they said, we wish you were doing it all because your standard of care and diligence on stuff are more than a lot of the major institutions. So, I mean, to get that sort of recognition, um, you know, now OSFI never comes to see us if, if we're gonna administer a mortgage for a new credit union or something, it's sort of, we just have the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, oh, first staff are doing it, that's fine, there's no questions. Sensational. All right, so let's move to the markets. I think we probably all want to know what you're thinking about the markets today. So, Maury, when you, when you think about today's market moving towards 2020, what's your take on it? What do you see? Um, you know, I don't like anything I see in the market. Nothing. I don't like the world economy. I don't like trade. Uh, the only thing I like is real estate because it's a stable form of, of, of uh, income that people are coming around around the world and everyone is coming around and starting to say, hey, you know what? You know, I used to say I needed a 10% return. Then I needed a 7% return. Now I need a five or 4% return. And real estate can, you know, uh, you know, all forms of real estate, industrial, retail, you know, especially apartment buildings, they can give you that sort of stable type of, uh, stable type of returns and interest rates are low. And quite frankly, I believe interest rates are going lower. I've been telling all my clients for the last year, don't worry about interest rates. They're gonna be lower this year, next year than they are this year. And I'm gonna say again, they're gonna be lower next year than they are this year. Uh, and that, that's providing windfalls now. You know, Historically, I think when you take your cap rate that you purchase at and you take your, your end mortgage rate on a 10 year term, you know, if you got a one and a half basis, 150 basis points over spread between, you're doing pretty well. You know, now in things like retail, you know, you're getting like a three and a half or four point spread on some of it. It's industrial, a little bit less. And of course, apartments, as we all know, a little bit less again. But still, the spread on, you know, between your mortgage coupon and, and your real estate is, uh, is as wide as it's ever been for, since I've been in the business. And your income continues to go up and up and up. So I don't know anyone that's in the real estate business that's afraid of the real estate business. Everyone's afraid of Trump. They're afraid of China. They're afraid of you know, stagnant growth everywhere. But you know, re you know, you still put a Shoppers Drug Mart and a Walmart. You know, if you're buying it at five and three quarter cap or whatever. You know that they're going to be paying for the next 20 years or a lot of laws. So it gives you, you know, you're still getting five percent cash on cash and nine or ten percent return on equity. You know, it's, you know, pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. pretty good returns when you look at everything else. Everyone's worried about the stock market and, and other areas. So uh, very positive on real estate, very positive apartments. 
Okay, so you mentioned interest rates. Um, for all of us who are thinking about trends, what are the other trends that you're really fixated on today and what should the rest of us be thinking about? The only concern I think in, is uh, in construction is the cost has just gone crazy. And not for any reason other than greed. Like the farming companies have three times as much work as they do. They just keep saying, you know, I don't really want this work, but if you pay me this much, okay, I'll do it. Uh, and so, so a lot of the costs have gone crazy. I think we've talked to a lot of clients that said, oh my God, I have this great piece of land. Uh, There's a building and it's got a huge piece of land attached to it. I can put up another building. But when you start to do the numbers on it, even if you sort of roll your land cost in for free, mm -hmm. You know, unless you're in a really prime, prime re, um, location for apartment where you're going to be able to get three fifty, four bucks a foot rent, they don't make sense. You want to build another building in Scarborough, my homeland, Rexdale? You know, it doesn't matter the land is free. The cost to construct is just too huge. And rents keep going up and you're turning apartments over and everyone's gone to that turning apartments over. You know, it used to be apartments turned over 30% a year, you know, and then it went down to 20 you know, it's down now to three, you know, three or four percent in, in Toronto, Vancouver, I'm sure exactly the same. And, you know, it's going to get lower. People are not going to be, even if they get a job, they're living in, you know, Etobicoke and they get a job in Scarborough. They're not going to be able to afford to move because people are, are just, you know, taking that $1,200 a month rent and rumping it up to $1,800 a month. So that's a concern that, you know, with all the new construction, uh, and the way people are rolling up rents, you really have to stop the mobility of people moving around in the city. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a big concern for me. I'm feeling that. And what about, um, one of the drivers that I think is quietly behind all of this too is population growth. When you look at Canada versus the G7, there's a lot of population growth. It's driving all this building, driving costs. What do you think of population growth for Toronto? You know, the pop population growth and immigration growth has not typically been people coming with wads of money and great jobs, right? They're immigrants trying to get away from a, a, the, a worse economic situation or a livable situation, moving to a country that they feel has some opportunity, but they don't come in and can afford $1,800 a month for rent. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it worries me that people will stop coming. And you know what? Tim Hortons is still paying 14 bucks an hour. It doesn't matter that rents have gone to $1,800 or $1,800 a month. You know, incomes are not actually going up. In fact, incomes have been very, very flat, you know, over the last three or four years. And if you take Europe, incomes are actually really down. Like Europe to me is, you know, you know, the northern, you know, what we consider the old, you know, the old economies of, of Europe, Canada, US, our standard of living has gotten so high that um, it just can't keep going. Now that we've got trade going around the world, it's time for all those, you know, I'll call them the third world countries, they're not anymore, to bring their standards of living up. And that's sort of really flattening out our standards of living. You know, manufacturing's disappearing. Um, and so incomes are not gonna go up unless you're in a specialized service business. But for the average person, the incomes are not gonna go up. So I don't know where the housing support level is to buy houses to uh, pay for new apartments, to pay four or five bucks a foot, unless mom and dad are helping. And I think everyone that's here that got kids have had to throw some money in to help them get their down payment or more. And it's concerning. I'm just not sure that, that real estate values are not gonna soften slowly and continue to soften till we get affordability back. I, I think a tag along to that is just again tax rates. One of my big issues is just how much tax we pay as Canadians. So it's tough to have that $1,800 a month to pay rent or whatever. I couldn't agree more. So when, when you think back on all the great people you've been around, when you think about the advice you've been given, what can you share with the audience just in terms of great advice that they can benefit from, please? You know, I heard a great, I don't give advice very much because I heard a great stat that only 2% of advice you give people are actually taken and used. Everyone will listen to advice, but people don't usually take advice. They don't change their attitude or, or what they're doing by the advice that you give. All right, can everyone get their pen out then, please? I want to see you writing this down. Here. And that right. was it. Right. Right. Uh, no, I think, um, you, you know, you've got, to be a, you've got to be a good person. You know, you've got to work with other people. There's a lot of people in this room that you think of all the people you work with. Think of the, uh, you know, the, the superintendents, 
your tenants, you know, all your trades, you know, you have to be reasonable and fair to people. And, you know, it's, it's much easier to be liked than it is to be disliked. Some people like that, that feeling of, you know, if they fear me, that's good. You know, I don't think it's, I think you want people to come to you with their problems mm -hmm. uh, for help. And, you know, that's how you build uh, loyalty in any sort of job, business, relationship. Uh, is that, you know, you try to, you know, work on the level of the people you're working with or your customers or your clients or your staff or the person, sales, you know, selling you coffee at, uh, you know, at uh, Starbucks. You know, you, you know, be a good human being. And I think the rewards are, are truly amazing in your, heal, in, in your whole life. One thing I can tell you about Maury is when you're with him, he always makes it about other people. It's never about Maury. So just doing this, I'm always impressed to see you helping. But the way you always go out of your way to do it about other people and give them the results, very impressive. Okay, um, so there's a lot of people out there that are going, hmm, probably wouldn't be bad to be Maury Toss. So what advice would you give the people who want to be the next Maury Toss? And how would you, how would you just give them a couple of ideas? You know, <laughs> you know, everyone wants to have some money, but you know, it's a pretty low limit of money you need to be happy. Everything over that is just excess and it's just gonna cause you problems somewhere. So, uh, you know, you'd be happy in your work, you'd be happy in your relationships with people, you know, your family, spend more time with your family if you can, don't miss a baseball game, don't miss the hockey game. Don't miss uh, a birthday party. Leave work at four while your kids are young and make sure you get to everything. Coach them, do all those things. Those are the things when I look back at my, my life. I still hang out with all my high school friends. You know, a lot of them never came in. We came from Rexdale. A lot of them grew up as guys in Rexdale, right? They, you know, they got sort of middle jobs, but I still love hanging out with them, playing hockey, going for beers with them. I mean, you know, your, your old friends, your friends are your true friends and they're usually the things that make you happy. It's not your business relationships with, you know, the senior vice president here or the president there, or I know so-and-so. That usually doesn't make you happy. It's, you know, hanging around with the people that you like, you know, your wife, your kids, your friends. You know, money sort of, it's always easy when you have money to say it's not important, but uh, it doesn't make you extra happy. Okay, so here's two last questions here. So we've got some elections coming up. What happens in October here in Canada, what happens in 2020 in the US? What do you, what do you see there? And does that affect our business environment? Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love my politicians. You know, I, I'm gonna say I love Pierre Trudeau. You know, I I, you know, I love Brian Mulroney. You know, I felt they were, Jean Chrétien to me was one of the greatest Canadian leaders. I don't think he was smart, but he was a great leader and he could, he could turn his lip and he could say, we've got to do this and we're going to do this and we're doing this as Canadians. And people believed him and got behind him. We just don't have politicians like that anymore. You know, you talk, you know, do you like Trudeau? Do you like Scheer? You know, and everyone's, ah, you know. We don't seem to get quality people going into politics anymore. They're kind of lifers that sort of get left in politics, you know, and I think this is, this is a huge problem. You know, and so then you start getting the ones that are really out there on the right or really out there on the left. I mean, look at Donald Trump. I think, you know, we're Canadians. I think I know what most of us think about Donald Trump here. Uh, you know, he's still got such a huge support base in the it's U.S., yep. you know, and, uh, you know, part of me says Donald Trump, you know, boy, he's really, you know, he's standing up for American jobs and, uh, you know, the thing he's doing with China is right, but there's no new jobs being created in the States. In fact, it's, they're losing jobs now. So, you know, you need smart, intelligent people in, in politics and even the backroom politics. Those people are disappearing. It used to be the minds that ran politics. People, big business leaders were in the back rooms helping you know, helping to grow policy and, and shape the government's ideas, they're just not there anymore. And to me, you know, the quality of our, we're just getting watered down and watered down in our politics. And so, you know, who are you gonna vote for this year, you know? I said to someone, I'm gonna vote green. You know, like, uh, I don't like this and I don't like that. So a green vote tells them that I don't like either of you and, you know, politics have to change. I don't think green's gonna get in at all, but it tells them that, you know, we get enough votes 
it tells them that people are unhappy with the status quo of what politicians are. And, uh, I, you know, I think everyone should be more... Everyone should be more interested in politics, have more opinions, and, and tell people what they think about it. Because, you know, our life is so good here, we just get very, very complacent. And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not spending the time, um, you know, to help build a better country and, you know, better governance. Well, I just want to say, Maury, thank you very much on behalf of the conference today. Just, it was an incredible insight into who you are. And, and I've got to say, it's, it's been a privilege to see you grow up just in the business, what you represent, what you do. It makes all of us as an industry look better. First National, again, I can't say enough about it. So just all the best, good luck with the future, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Mm -hmm.